Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Entrepreneur Mind Speak. I'm Lauren with Creme de Mint, a branding and packaging design agency, and I'm here with my co-host, Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie, founder of Cloud Create, a web development and design agency in Tampa. And today we are welcoming Marsha Chowdhury. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, Marsha. Thank you so much for having me, Lauren. Thank you, Natalie. I'm so excited to discuss uh, EWC. Awesome, awesome. So Marsha, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this field of regulatory compliance, um, how you ended up in the beauty and wellness industry, and what led you to start your own firm? I'd love to hear about this. Yes, it's been a journey. Um, and so I started my career as a consumer advocate, working on women's health policy and cosmetic policy. I, I was in DC at the time and I lobbied on the issue of cosmetic policy and how it impacts consumers and especially marginalized groups. And so I was a big advocate at the time of uh, safety of the ingredients, just uh, the FDA having more oversight on the regulatory authority of cosmetics and really ensuring that the products that are marketed and sold in the U.S. are safe for consumers. And I did a lot of uh, thought leadership, um, participated in coalitions and led coalitions, consumer advocate coalitions. And so when MOGRA was passed after years of advocacy, I even testified before Congress and the FDA on the issue. And so when MOGRA was passed in 2022, I at the time was part a uh, part-time consultant consulting with uh, consumer policy nonprofit organizations. And I decided to pivot to work with brands and help them in compliance because I was so familiar with the law and really have a passion for the policy and the, the law itself. And so um, last year I you know started getting ready to work with brands and I've been working with brands since. I work with beauty brands in helping them with FDA compliance. I work with facilities as well. We do registrations and act as US agent. But all things compliance related from label reviews to um, helping brands get registered with the FDA to even looking at claims um, and a host of other things. Other things come up. Um, and because I also have a background as an attorney, um, I'm able to assist brands in a very unique way that I really enjoy. That's amazing. What an amazing culmination of skill sets and interests. That's incredible. Thank you. I really, I, I enjoy it so much. Awesome. And can you uh, touch a little bit more on what MOCRA is and how that impacts the industry? Because I have a feeling that a lot of people probably aren't very familiar with the significance of that. Yeah, MOCRA is short for the Modernization of the Cosmetic Regulation Act. And it was passed in 2022. And a lot of the um, requirements came into effect last year and started being implemented this year. And so it has a list of requirements that uh, cosmetic brands and facilities need to comply with from registering their products with the FDA, well, listing their products with the FDA, registering the facility. Um, there's updates to labels. So having the responsible person's contact on the label, and then there's a mechanism that brands are required to have for adverse event reporting. And there are more changes to come, but it's uh, it's the biggest change or a change in the cosmetic industry that we've been advocating for, myself and other consumer advocates for years. And it's come after over 80 years of no kind of regulation or legislation um, in the cosmetic industry. Wow, thank you so much for elaborating on that. 
That is definitely something I feel like people and brands will love help with to be able to make sure that they're compliant since I'm sure a lot of them have had certain things in place for many years. Some skincare brands have, of course, been around for decades. So being able to manage these kinds of changes, not to mention new brands just starting out that have to become familiar um, with this, that's wonderful that you're helping them through. Yeah, I work with both established brands and startups. So, you know, they have different needs and it's really exciting to be able to assist them with something that I'm still familiar with. Awesome. So tell us a little bit more about like what kind of challenges are businesses going to face in complying with MOCRA? Like, are there key elements that, you know, they can focus on? Um, so that their cosmetic labels meet those standards? Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, compliance is something that should be done at the very outset of the process of getting your product market ready. And one of the challenges I find is that some brands did not do that, go through that process at the outset. And then they're having to organize all of their information. So there's a lot of document management that goes into this process, um, you know, being or organized, keeping organized. And with the adverse event reporting, you know, having and creating a mechanism so that you are able to capture consumer issues and complaints and then report it to the FDA. I find that with the already established brands, um, some of them don't have this process in place. And so we do advise and have a system that we share with our clients so that they're able to organize that process. And we help assess whether, you know, a, a, an issue is a serious adverse event and report it to the FDA. As for newer brands, um, you know, especially startups, compliance is something that I find that a lot of people weren't thinking about prior to MOCRA. And so with MOCRA, it's pushing startups to start thinking about compliance sooner. And I love it. And I, you know, we work collaboratively with the with the startups, but it seems that a lot of it is a lot of fear and anxiety around the process. But by the time we get our brands compliant, they're excited. They feel confident about moving forward with their products because they know that, you know, they at least on the legal front, um, for the most part, they're not going to have any issues and they just feel ready and, uh, you know, they feel like they have a solid product that they're they're ready to go forward with, um, you know, wherever they are at in the process of getting the product out in the market. That's amazing. And since it is a rather complicated um, thing for for a novice, right, for a new brand or a brand that maybe isn't too familiar with um, compliance in itself, how do you guide them through this? Having all the information you have, um, how do you make it so that they can actually understand it and implement it and use it and become that confident? Yeah, it, it's a lot of hand holding, um, you know, and I have the patience for it and education as well. So we typically have a few meetings where, well, one, we're discovering what their needs are. And then once we explain the requirements, you know, collecting, there's a collaborative effort in collecting the information they need and then assessing where there are gaps. Um, but throughout the whole process, you know, we try to be as accessible as possible and have meetings with clients there. Sometimes I have to explain things over and over, which is fine. And, you know, clients will apologize. And I'm like, well, you're not a regulatory expert, so it's OK. You know, this is not familiar to you. Um, so that's one of the things that I think um, happens a lot in, in the process, but it's really a collaborative effort. There's, you know, like I said, being organized is really important in this process. Um, and then there's a lot of education that goes into it as well on, on our part. Should clients think about bringing you into their process? And the second question I have to kind of add to it is like, are there specific regulatory examples of like if people don't hire somebody like you that they could end up, you know, making this specific type of mistake? Yeah, I think it we should be brought on as soon as the product is developed and before it goes to market. 
And um, as far as examples, I won't call out any specific brands, but I'm sure, you know, we've seen in the news or we've seen um, stories about brands and different retailers being called out or sued, you know, even worse for claims that they, they made on their label that they hadn't substantiated prior to marketing or they were lacking disclosures that were required because of some of the ingredients that were used that are used in their products. So having a compliance person do these, you know, check, check off these things before you go on the market is so essential. And it's not something to be taken lightly. You can be sued, it can cost you money, and it can cost your brand's reputation. And do manufacturers, do they, I mean, do you work with the manufacturers and do manufacturers sometimes provide this service to their clients? Like where does that, how does somebody know? Because a lot of times people will come to, to me after they've gone to the manufacturer and, you know, we'll design their label and everything like that. And I just wondering, like, where is it in their timeline? Where is it, where, how would they come across you to know that, hey, this is something I need? Yeah, it's so unorganized, to be honest. There are <laughs> manufacturers. Um, there are manufacturers that have regulatory people, and then there are some that don't. So it really depends on who your manufacturer is. I I work with clients who's who've gone through the process of completing the label, manufacturing the products, and I take a look at the label. And at first glance, I'm already like, yeah, this is wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I do a deeper dive and I'm like, okay, well, one of these ingredients require dis a disclosure on the label. So then you have to redo the label. So it really depends on what manufacturer you use. And, you know, even some manufacturers that have regulatory, maybe they need like a legal eye for claims. So it, um, you know, my clients find me through word of mouth a lot. I have clients that I've worked with and they just refer me. This year, I've helped co-authored a few articles on Mokra uh, with a partner at Morgan Lewis, who I've been working closely with, uh, Rachel Raphael. And, um, you know, so as far as uh, clients finding me, they find me through some of the thought leadership that I've produced on this issue, and then also client referrals. But it's really important, I think, regardless of your manufacturer, it's always okay to call and talk to a regulatory expert because there may be gaps either way. Like if a manufacturer has a regulatory uh, department, there still may be some gaps. And if they don't, you definitely need a compliance partner. I think that's a very good idea. Having definitely witnessed some of those things in the news, like you mentioned, um, using products myself, having used a product myself that had a recall actually, which luckily nothing happened to me, but it was still a bit of a scare. Um, I definitely think all brands should reach out to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank goodness nothing happened to you. Absolutely, yeah. Why is facility registration so crucial under the new FDA standards and what steps should businesses take to ensure compliance? Yeah, it's uh, so facility registration is extremely crucial. Well, for one, um, a brand cannot register their products or whoever is registering the responsible, responsible person cannot register or list products with the FDA unless the associated facility has been registered. So it's the first step in the entire process to kick it off. And then as far as um, you know, it being important, if your facility is not registered, then you can't list the products with the FDA. So it's a, it's a huge responsibility and facilities, you know, definitely need to take it seriously. And they don't, you know, it delays the process for a responsible person trying to get compliant in the first place. You mentioned um, adverse events earlier. Can you elaborate on the importance of adverse event record keeping yeah. and serious adverse event reporting in the cosmetics industry? I'm just curious. I want to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, adverse event reporting is a key requirement regardless of brand size. So Mokra does have exceptions for small businesses, but adverse event reporting is one of those things that all brands need to comply with regardless of size. And it's a new requirement under Mokra and it starts really with the label. So having the contact person, contact responsible person on the label. So we always recommend a website or a 
um, email address where consumers can reach the brand if they're if they have an adverse event. And then from there, you want to start or you need to start record keeping. And like I mentioned, we have a link that we share with our clients where they can send to their consumers should an adverse event come up. And that's happened already this year for us, um, for our brand. And um, so you want to have a, a process in place so that you can capture that because it is a requirement to have a record of adverse events for three years for small businesses and six years for, for uh, big big businesses. And regardless, there needs to be someone to assess the seriousness of the adverse event. And if it's a serious adverse event, it needs to be reported to the FDA within 15 business days. So it's not something that brands should sleep on. It's a it's an actual requirement, regardless of business size. And I think it's really important. So if someone, if a brand doesn't do it, they could end up getting sued, they could end up getting shut down. Well, what? it's suit definitely. I mean, sure. you know, depending on, well, one, they're not following the regulatory requirements, but then there's the other issue of the consumer that was harmed. You know, mm -hmm. we have litigation partners, like I mentioned, um, my, the partner that I work with at Morgan Lewis, so that we, you know, will can refer uh, clients to if they are in a, um, you know, have a legal issue of that nature, but um, it is something that should definitely be taken serious. And you always want to have a record, anyways. You know, you want to be able to understand what's going on with your product. So I think just like at a basic level, um, having that record and and knowing you know how your product is doing in the market and if it's impacting consumers in a negative way is very important. It's very interesting to hear you talk about this as a consumer and also having done quite a few prod projects myself building websites for brands in this space. It's interesting to think about it from this perspective because it seems very obvious. Like, of course, every brand should have this. There's like that you shouldn't even have to make a rule about that. But of course, that's not how it goes in the real world. Businesses get busy, they get caught up with development, they get caught up with marketing, they get caught up with expansion. And these kinds of things, which seem so obvious and are so important, I'm sure have fell, fallen through the, uh, the cracks before. So having that now be regulated and for all business sizes so that every business will be able to pull a product or check the batches or whatever is actually so amazing. Um, so that's wonderful that that's now regulated and how amazing that you helped make that happen. Yes, it is. And, and you know, it's not super difficult, I think. Well, but I have my own biases as a regulatory <laughs> compliance expert. Um, but it is something that, like I said, it, it's just part of like the organizing process and just you know, being able to have this system in place, which if you do it at the very beginning, then you just, you know, you don't really have to worry about it. And you know that it's there and you have this system in place that's compliant with the uh, regulation. What systems and processes do you recommend for businesses to efficiently manage these requirements? Is there something specific, like you had already mentioned, of course, the contact? Is it a specific form that um, companies should have on their website? Um, is that enough? Do they need to have a contact number? Tell us a little bit about how companies can really comply with this if they don't already. Yes. So as far as adverse event reporting, there are different ways you can go about uh, meeting the requirements, I can say that, you know, EWC, we have a web link that we share mm -hmm. with our clients that they can then pass over to their consumer should an issue come up. But there are different ways you can, you can comply. At the end of the day, you have to have a mechanism in which you're able to capture a record and then assess it and then report it to the FDA should the issue be a serious adverse event. Um, so there's, you know, there's, you can be creative, but you just wanna make sure that you're following the protocol. And one of the ways in which we came up with doing that is having this organized process. And Marsha, I noticed that um, you offer your clients strategic development and program assessments. Can you describe your approach to evaluating existing brands or programs and identifying opportunities for growth? 
And then also another question, like what are some of the common areas for improvement that you've identified in your assessments? Yeah, so because I come from a consumer background and a program, um, you know, I was a policy manager at a national women's uh, network. And so I, one of the responsibilities I had was developing an entire cosmetic policy program. So with that experience, I took and created this service to assist. Well, I started with assisting uh, nonprofit organizations with the program development, but it's worked for my clients who don't have certain programs in place um, from recall programs or recall mechanisms um, for, for distributors to brands that are smaller and wanting a process. So it really is flexible. It depends on the client. I work with distributors, I work with brands, and I also work with facilities. So it starts with assessing what their needs are and where there are gaps and how we can assist them. One of the interesting things um, I remember you sharing with me is that you have done quite a bit of grant writing. Yes. And I was curious to see how you can assist your clients in creating proposals that can help them secure funding. Is that something you have done for your clients? Yes. Yes. And I want to hear more about this. I think this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's interesting now working with small startups, especially uh, marginalized groups who need funding. And I know that there are tons of opportunities for, um, you know, marginalized businesses, women-owned businesses uh, to pursue funding for opportunities like that. And so I do have a background in grant writing and mm -hmm. I have clients now that I am working on a grant with. Uh, we, we received funding or the clients received funding through my assistance to do a study in California. This is a food uh, client. So I do cosmetics and I also do food as well. And so this group is looking at a study. They're doing a study in California for WIC approved products and they're assessing the levels of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the products. And they're almost done with the study. This was, a, it's a two year study and it was about a year ago that they received the funding. But um, I assisted with the grant writing process. We received, they received the funding and I'm also gonna be assisting with disseminating the study and doing some marketing um, you know, to promote the, the study or to, to help share the study because I still have relationships with my former clients who were nonprofit consumer advocacy groups. And then from there, just having that experience, being able to assist my clients. I have clients that are startups that are looking to, you know, get more funding to get their products out there and get into retail even, which is a lot oftentimes the, the end goal. So yes, I, I help and assist uh, brands and nonprofit organizations with grant uh, support and grant writing and all of that. Amazing. That is amazing. I can't wait to share that information with other people because I do get that question often from clients. Like, how can I get funding? Can I get grants? And I didn't, until I met you, I didn't know anybody who was doing that specific work. And so I'm excited that, that you do that. And <laughs> yeah, it's really exciting. And I'm also a judge and a mentor for a grant opportunity. It's a, it's a lift accelerator program through Patchology and they are providing five brands with funding, um, and also mentorship to get their products market ready. And I'm a judge for the process. And it's, it's interesting to be on both sides, to be not only on the uh, grant writing side, but now I have some experience in reviewing, you know, what people are asking for, what people are, are doing to, or, you know, proposing for these grants as well, especially in the beauty industry. So tell us a little bit more about that particular um, lift opportunity, just in case anybody's listening and they want to look more into it. Yes, it the, the opportunity passed last month as far as applicant, uh, the application is closed, but I know that they're going to be doing it again next year. 
And it's been in the works for, I believe, two years at least. Um, but it's through Patchology and they've partnered with JCPenney as well. And I think it's an amazing opportunity for black owned, it's for black owned businesses. I believe it may be black and brown owned businesses, but it's for the groups who are underrepresented in cosmetics and to assist them with getting their products ready. And, and it's just an amazing opportunity, I think. And it's an amazing program. And I'm so excited to be a part of the process, to be a mentor for the finalists or the, the, the five brands that are picked and to also be a part of the judging process to get a, you know, better understanding of how it works. And all of this is for, is better um, experience for me to assist my clients who some of which are startups looking to get brand, um, grants themselves. So it's great. That is so amazing, especially in this climate right now, where I feel like it is a little bit harder for new brands to grow, considering just the cost of starting up, marketing costs these days, the cost of raw materials has gone up over the last four or five years a lot. So being able to give a break to these new brands um, that you're representing, that is so amazing. Yes, it's I, I really enjoy being able to assist and just knowing the hurdles and the, you know, the the disproportionate impact that that's with that's in the industry for marginalized groups. So it's it's really exciting and rewarding. Now, going on to trends, so Lauren and I are always working with various different kinds of trends, especially on the marketing side. Um, so do you see any kind of trends in the regulatory landscape for beauty and wellness industries, or is it a little bit more, I imagine it's a little slower moving being regulatory, but I'm curious if you see some trends in that regard. It is slower moving on the regulatory side. I mean, Mocha is new. So as far as regulatory compliance is concerned, there are a few more things that are coming within Mocha. Like for example, there's an allergen rule that is set mm. to be proposed. I, I believe in October it had, it was supposed to be proposed already, but it, it got pushed. But, um, so that's that's all I can speak to regarding <laughs> regulatory trends. I have a little question that I just thought of, and it's not totally related, but um, I'm just curious now. So what I have seen happen a lot trend wise is that when people have a bad experience with a product, you'll find out about it through social media, whether it's a product that you've used or not used or whatever, if it had a significant impact in that person, you'll see sometimes these people go viral for whatever effects that a particular product had on their skin or, or whatever the product is for. Um, is that something that companies are now having to monitor and really, obviously they have these, um, you know, structured, organized ways for people to report to them when they have a bad experience, but what about these kind of Wild West type formats where people are making TikToks that go viral about some product? Is this something that brands are, uh, need to be alert to these days that there could be issues arising outside their normal um, avenues? Yeah, um, I think it's important as a millennial and yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it might be important for, for brands to, you know, pay attention to the viral TikTok videos. I actually saw one recently regarding claims. Actually, this falls into regulatory. You know, there was a viral video of a girl like trashing, literally had, has a trash bag, trashing all the all these different um, products for textured hair because... Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't, I, I can't, I won't quote it directly, but basically essentially saying that, you know, these products don't actually work for my hair when you have to throw away all the products. And that's something that, that is really big within the black and brown community, I'll say, especially as a consumer. And I'm a part of the community myself, you know, had seeing products with all these amazing claims, but it doesn't actually do those things. Um, across the board, not just for me, but, you know, my friends and my family and even seeing these viral videos on, on social media about products. So I think it's important for brands to be aware about of, of, of TikTok and <laughs> Instagram and uh, the virality of, 
of uh, a, their product because I would hate to be a brand and then see my product going viral on social media and you know it's it's a bad viral video um, yeah getting trashed uh, who yeah, wants that brand. yeah <laughs> yeah um and and I think there's a level of honesty that consumers have on these platforms that you know where their brands should be paying attention to because it's it's raw and it's real and it's honest what advice would you give to beauty entrepreneurs to ensure that their compliance strategies are robust and forward thinking? Yeah, I would I would advise beauty brands to get have a compliance partner to to include that in the budget. This is about being legally compliant and making sure that your products are safe for consumers. So I think it's a very important part of the process and it shouldn't be skipped and, and it should be taken very seriously. I, I feel like you could end your brand before it even gets started if you don't pay attention to some of these. Yeah, that's yeah. unfortunately happened for some brands. Um, so now getting to just kind of our last final uh, questions here. So as a Black woman leading a firm in a highly specialized field, what challenges and opportunities do you feel that you've had? Yeah, that's a, whoa, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, I would say that there's just, there's a disparity. There's an obvious disparity I don't see other service providers that look like me um, in, in the industry. You know, I come from a consumer advocacy background. And when I was in that space, I was advocating for policy changes that impact my community. And then now that I'm working in the industry, on the industry side, I don't even see us on the service provider side and there's a lot of opportunities in this space and i just think that it's unfortunate because you know even women in general i i don't see as many of us in the important decision making roles and the service providing roles so there's just a disparity i think across the board from service providers to people who are making important decisions about cosmetics in which i believe women use more of anyways and so, I was just thinking that absolutely yeah. yeah but of course when when there's a lot of money involved in an industry you'll see a lot of disparities unfortunately I've worked with quite a few um, beauty brands and oftentimes the ones that I've worked with, they've been woman owned, you know, which is always so wonderful. Um, but I don't necessarily interact, of course, with the whole industry and who is managing this industry and who is controlling it as a whole. So it's very interesting to hear that. And I definitely hope that that changes as time goes on, because we do have different experiences and needs and we want everybody to be represented. Yeah, and also different perspectives, you know, yeah. I myself as a black woman, Caribbean woman, um, you know, I bring a different perspective than my counterparts to the beauty industry and, you know, the, the decision making process, because I have my own unique experience. And um, so it's interesting. And, and what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of that and of your work in compliance in general? Yeah. Oh, I could go on and on about this. I just, I love working with brands. I'm working at the end of the day, I'm working with entrepreneurs who are often, you know, just, they have the most amazing ideas and products, products that I use myself uh, from makeup brands to skincare brands. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to bring, help be a part of the process to bring their products to the market and also, it's really great to see them feel confident about their product, knowing that they've checked off that regulatory part that's often so stressful for brands. So that's really exciting. And just being able to work alongside very smart boss women. <laughs> I love that. I feel the I same that. in my line of work. <laughs> awesome um and any final thoughts or messages you would like to share with our audience about regulatory about anything i mean anything that comes to mind and then like how can people get in touch with you 
Yeah. Um, as far as regulatory, I, I said it before, it's very important. It's, you know, it's not something to just wait till the end or wait till your products are already in retail. It's something that you should do at the outset of the process, partner with a regulatory compliance expert and, you know, take it very seriously. And I think that um, as far as the beauty industry as a whole, I'm really excited to see where it's going, to see more beauty brands, even, you know, pay attention to regulatory because it, it doesn't sound as fun as the marketing and the product development, but it's great when I get clients and there's their concern and they want to make sure that it's right and it's right for consumers. So there's a part of me, like my advocacy, consumer advocacy side that gets really excited about that process. Um, and then as far as reaching me, my website is equitywellness.org and you can reach me at info at equitywellness.org. This has been an um, just so such an interesting topic to talk to you about because I just don't like, I feel like I don't know as much as I would like to know about it. So this has been, and I think a lot of our audience doesn't either. And I really feel like um, that whoever listens to this, that they're going to find it immensely helpful and really understand how important it is um, to do, you know, to think about compliance from the get-go. Yeah, yeah, I'm so excited. I think it was a great conversation and I love the questions you asked and I hope that it's helpful for beauty brands. I think this is an important conversation and yeah. Very yeah, absolutely. Awesome. I feel like you've explained it all in such a wonderful way for everybody to be able to understand too. And I really appreciate that. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be super technical all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I get this feeling that if anybody were to work with you, that it would feel like an easy process because you're so passionate about it and you feel like such at ease with it and you're excited about it, that it would just like kind of flow and so that I, I hope that <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I think my clients would say the same thing. You know, yeah. I, I come in with a very positive attitude and I like I, I just I enjoy the work. It's you know, yeah. it's fun to me. And um I think my clients are pleased. So yeah. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Entrepreneur Minds Speak. Um, thank you guys and um that's it. <laughs> <laughs>